this is a new 3D version of Nintendo's Donkey Kong. This technology marks a new era. Now, with all this technology, am I going to have to buy an adapter for my home Nintendo? Not at all. Absolut sensationell. 32 bit Qualität auf dem 16 bit Super Nintendo. Two million uh, have been pre sold to retailers. It's all the shading and stuff. It's really well shaded. Everything looks so rounded. And you're really going to think that it's a game that's a generation ahead of its time. The graphics are an example of a revolution. Game na yo wa chisa na kodomo kara otona made asuberu. Morphing rocks. Those guys are so cool. You yeah. touch these barrels and the lights turn on and off. And uh, these rock guys just kind of rolled up. Fully realistic, fully rendered 3D graphics. It's generated through some breakthrough computer graphics that also happen to be used uh, to make the dinosaurs come to life in Jurassic Park. You have to have it. You know it. Get it. It's one of those games you don't get bored with. Yeah. You know, I've played it probably a hundred times, over a hundred times now, and I'm still getting better. I'll tell you what, you better reserve this game before November 21st, because that's when it comes out in the stores. I already got mine. In 1994, it's not an understatement to say that Donkey Kong Country was taking the world by storm, and that the graphical presentation used for the game was so impressive for the time that there were people asking whether or not this was for the next generation of consoles. But only talking to what the game did back then is not giving the game enough credit for what it still does to this very day. This was the title that managed to breathe new life into Donkey Kong, and despite drastically changing the character's design, it pulled off the impressive feat of being welcomed with open arms by video game fans across the globe, and its soundtrack being cited as one of the best to this very day. The Animal Buddies, the level design, the cast of characters, and the enemies themselves, it was all able to knock it out of the park right off the bat that it's still critically examined by video game enthusiasts as well as game journalists for how to do a 2D action game right. The game went on to sell 9 million copies, making it the third best-selling Super Nintendo game. It also held the record for the fastest-selling video game of all time during its launch. But every great legacy to every great game has a team of people behind it that made that possible. And so, for the 25th anniversary of Donkey Kong Country, I decided to do something a little bit special. Five of the original team members who worked on the game are going to be here today to discuss their story with you, and it brings me a great honor to be able to introduce them all to you right now. We have the game's lead designer, Greg Mails. Greg Mails has a long history at the company Rare, having getting his start on Solar Jetman in 1990, but also worked on really incredible titles such as Battletoads, Banjo-Kazooie, Conker's Bad Fur Day, and even as recent as Sea of Thieves. He continues to work at Rare to this very day. On the side of video game composers, we have one of the most legendary in the industry, David Wise. David is very well known for his contributions to Donkey Kong Country, and was even brought back by Nintendo to compose for Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. To talk about all things programming, we have the game's lead programmer, Chris Sutherland. Chris shared a lot of projects with Greg Mails, having worked on Battletoads, Banjo-Kazooie, Perfect Dark, Banjo-Tooie, and these days working as project director for Ukulele. And for character design, we have brother of Greg Mails, Steve Mails on deck. Steve did amazing work on titles such as Battletoads and Double Dragon. He was also lead character designer for Banjo and Kazooie. Here in this title, he has credit of giving final design to King K. Rool, as well as final designs for nearly all the enemies in the game. And finally, our last guest that we will start off with is Kevin Bayless. Kevin is very well known for his contribution to the Killer Instinct series. He's been spending a lot of his time recently at Playtonic Games, and he's also just recently announced a new game, Salamandos. But we will be starting the interview with Kevin today, as he shares how Donkey Kong Country came to be, as well as what he did to contribute to the game. So I've been told that you had to lead the project at a certain point to work on Killer Instinct, but the origins of Donkey Kong Country getting off the ground is still largely connected to you in a certain way. To your recollection, could you tell the viewer how it all got started? Yeah, um, we we started experimenting with the 3D um, software, which was called Power Animator at the time, and it's now uh, called Maya, um, and it's, it's sort of the industry standard for 3D modeling and, and rendered graphics. And um, we were sort of a, bit, a little bit ahead of ourselves, really. We were just experimenting with it, and I did a few tests, and all I'd ever wanted to do was make a fighting game. So I, I began making some models, um, to get a simple sort of demo together to sort of demonstrate what you could do with 3D rendered graphics and make a couple of characters look like uh, they were in a one-on-one -on -one fighting game. We did that, and then I think Nintendo came over to see us um, one one time in, in the middle of the summer, I think, and it was when they, um, they needed something really to put out there to um, pitch against Sega's Aladdin, 
which was um, it boasted really um, great looking animation from uh, the Disney um, animators, which worked on the on the actual uh, full motion uh, picture. And so it was going to have this this amazing animation. In it. And so um, Nintendo wanted something that was going to stand out that year. And uh, we said, well, we've been completely coincidentally, we'd been um, looking at all this 3D stuff. And so they, they had a look. We put a demo together for them before they came over just to let them see it. And they saw these two characters. I think it was when the game was called Brute Force at that point, And it was just a, like a working title. And I got, I think, a boxing character. And um, it was uh, the character which eventually became Orchid. And she was sort of wearing a, a red leotard and she had a staff rather than two tonfa. And... Um, they they looked really good, but it was just like a, an early sort of demo. And they looked at it and they were amazed at how solid everything looked. And they says, uh, "We well, we we want to sort of invest in this technology. We'll we'll take a look at this." And they went away and had a meeting. And uh, Tim Stamper came into the office the next day to see me uh, to let me know how the the meeting all went. And we'd only got one of these machines at the time. I think we may have just been in the process of getting another one to put upstairs in Tim's office. So I was, I'd was i sort of been given free reign with this machine, which I was really lucky with. And, um, yeah, he says, so, Kev, um, how do you fancy um, doing this character? Um, and he, he got this piece of paper out. It was a fax from Nintendo. He says, yeah, we've had a talk, and what we'd like to do is... Uh, We'd, we'd like you to take one of our existing characters that's not seen the light today for quite a while, and that's this. And it was a picture of Donkey Kong. And I, I was amazed because I thought they just wanted a new Donkey Kong character like uh, uh, Donkey Kong Jr. And this is no, what we want to do is we want to uh, bring that up to date and make it work for uh, a game on the Super Nintendo. Can, can you do that? And we knew that it would work because we'd already done all of the experiments with the, the 3D models and the, the fighting game. So it was just a matter of uh, spending a lot of time creating a, a simplified version of Donkey Kong, which I wanted to make really compact so it'd work. I was kind of still thinking along the lines of an NES game, um, something that was very sort of compact and would be a two by two size square sprite. So I designed this sort of really clunky little uh, DK character and just changed the face and I, I enlarged features so that it would show up nice and clearly I basically took the Battletoads eyes which I put on the Battletoads onto the Donkey Kong head because I always thought that gorillas looked like they've got this big brow oh, hold on wait one second so you're telling me this whole time I've been looking at Donkey Kong's design and I've never noticed that he has the same eyes as the Battletoads? Yeah, take a look. He's got those dust. Those, those are my trademark eyes. Now I'm starting to hear that you guys actually literally worked out of barns to start with. It was a farmhouse in the middle of the Warwickshire countryside, or Leicestershire as it was there, in, in Twycross. And the, the, the teams definitely had their own areas. And we happened to be in, as you came up the driver, in the barns on, on the left, in front of us and that was the DKC barn where, where all the development was done but there were other barns there and there were other areas where people developed and we all had our, our own section that we could get into with our own key but we didn't really venture onto the other teams unless it was vastly important and we were sharing technology but on the whole we were furiously um, uh, protective of our work and it it, there's good and bad with that. Obviously, we, we were focused on what we were doing and trying to beat the other team. And there were other times where it would have perhaps helped a little more if we had to share a bit, bit more of our technology with teams. But it was it, it kind of worked. Obviously, DKC seemed to do okay. I was working in my own office, which used to be the chicken sheds. And I was a bit out, out of the way. I wasn't in the main barn with everybody else. So I, I'd work in there. That There were no windows. It was a skylight. So I was very focused on what I was doing and I'd, I'd beaver away in there until I'd um, got a composition for people to hear and then I'd present it to the team and see whether they liked it or whether they didn't. And for you, Steve, I heard that when it came down to modeling the Kong specifically, uh, you contributed in a couple ways as well. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely remember doing some bits of Donkey Kong. In, in particular, I remember battling with, um, with his mouth shape 
um, for a long time. I just couldn't quite get it right. And then um, and Tim came up with a, a really simple solution, which I, in hindsight I should have thought of. But he basically just took a sphere and flattened it, then bent it over, and it was basically Donkey Kong's mouth. All the all the topology was flowing in the right way, so it had deform really nicely. And that became, that kind of uh, bent over sphere shape became um, part of most characters. It was always a mouth shape. And in some cases, like um, the fish on guard, the swordfish, it, it, the whole character is basically Donkey Kong's mouth with the end cut off and just stretched out into a fish shape. Wow. <laughs> DK didn't have a tie for quite a while. And then... Um, Miyamoto, like in those days, it was faxes. He'd fax these pictures through of DK with a tie on. And um, Tim was like, oh, yeah, that's great. We should add the tie on. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I've no idea how to add in, you know, joints to an existing skeleton. So I think Kev had to help me with that. It's a couple of other things they did as well. Um, Originally, he had... um, Four fi- no, originally he had three fingers because his fingers were quite fat and to give him uh, four fingers, it was going to make them quite thin. But they had, um, Tim reckoned it was because they have a, a big thing about, oh, you know, if it's it's the it's the accuser, isn't it? They, they cut off the little fingers. So they only have three fingers. So that's, I don't know whether he was having me on, but that was his explanation to me why they didn't want a three fingered character. That's incredible. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> he didn't used to have, you know, the kind of on his feet. He's got those sort of toe, toe, thumb things. You know, like he, he didn't, he didn't used to have those. That was another thing um, Miyamoto requested as well. Could you tell us the story about uh, how the project started with Donkey Kong Junior. and was later changed to Diddy Kong? I imagine Miyamoto must have been slightly involved with that, maybe. So to start with, we we took Donkey Kong. And we knew he was going to have a companion. So uh, Donkey Kong Jr. was the obvious choice. But but we wanted to bring him up to date because uh, we we kind of given Donkey Kong a makeover and made him look a bit more up to date. But Donkey Kong Jr. was was basically this like little little kind of ape with a nappy on, and we just we just didn't feel that fitted the kind of modern modern remake we wanted to do with with uh with what we wanted to build so so diddy kong actually was our proposed redesign of donkey kong jr but i think i think for nintendo that was a step too far i think we'd 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 gone so far from the original character that they weren't happy with it being called donkey kong jr Uh, and they said oh we like the character but please don't call it Donkey Kong Jr. Can you come up with a new name for the character? Um, so that's what we did. We wanted to incorporate the um, the dynamic with the tail on, on Diddy. And, and I think it um, wasn't um, Donkey Kong Jr. He didn't have a tail. It was uh, an ape, wasn't he? Not a monkey. And so we detached the two characters and we says, well, this isn't his... Um, this isn't his dad. This is a different guy. He's, uh, he's from the family, but he's not his dad. And so I think that's why we we did what we did with Diddy Kong, and we made him different. So and we expanded the whole universe that way by adding all of the characters that we did in the future games too. So yeah, and again, worked out well. And they've still got uh, Donkey Kong Junior there to play with, which is cool. <laughs> Diddy Kong wasn't wasn't his wasn't our first choice name actually. Um, Dinky Kong was first choice. We wanted Donkey. And Dinky, because um, Dinky means Dinky's kind of um, I think I don't know whether it's a British kind of colloquialism, but it means small, like something that's Dinky means small. Um, but we couldn't get it because of copyright reasons. Because there's also there's also a um, car manu there's also there was also a to- a, um, a toy car manufacturer that that used dinky car that they were called dinky cars because they were smaller versions of um full-size cars um so so we couldn't use dinky mm. that, that's a huge bullet dodge there honestly diddy kong sounds so much more i think iconic. we tried a couple more or dink there was dinky i'm sure there was another one we tried before we ended up with diddy 
And it got to the point where we, I'm sure the first two got knocked back because of legal reasons. And then one night I remember it was myself, Chris Sutherland, and I think my brother was involved. We sat around with a piece of paper trying to come up with alternatives, just literally just putting all sorts on a piece of paper. And, and as you always do when you, get, when, you, when you brainstorm, once you run out of good ideas, it just got stupid. And we were just coming up with all sorts of nonsense. But kind of, I think halfway, halfway down the serious suggestions was Diddy. Rare was a very British company um, at the time. I mean, it still is to many degrees, but it was very British in those days. So that's why Cranky Kong's got that very dry, sarcastic sense of humor. It's very British humor. Um, and it was the same with naming Diddy. Diddy, again, is a, it's like a British slang term for small. Um, so that's, that's why we like the name, and we got that one through. And at the time, we were, we're, a bit, we're a bit annoyed we couldn't have Dinky. But as you say, he's been Diddy now for 25 years, and, and it just fits. Yeah, absolutely. W- would you say that Diddy was probably the hardest character to come up with a name for? Because I know that you said um, when K. Rool got announced for Smash Ultimate that it was almost like a, a five-minute thought. to. Yeah, it was. It was. It was, I mean, I, I named most of the characters for the entire game. And when you've got to name that many characters, you, you don't sit and think about them for too long because you just haven't got time because you've got all sorts of other things to do. So, I mean, a, a, lot, of, a lot of the Kremlins were just the first, the names they've got were the first ones we came up with. Um, but K. Rool, K. Rool was pretty quick, as I remember. He certainly didn't have a piece of paper with a load of silly names written on it. But I'd say... I'd say Diddy, Diddy took us a long time, and Dixie for the second game. I definitely remember her having a piece of paper with all silly names at all. Not all they weren't all silly names. Some of them were very serious. But I think Dixie's original name was Diddy Ann because we wanted a link to Diddy because it was meant to be Diddy's girlfriend. So we just did the um, the feminine version of Diddy, but. Over time, we, we didn't like it, and it eventually got changed to Dixie, mm. uh, which probably suited her better. But it was it was definitely did Diddy Diddy was definitely the hardest one to do. So tell me, how, how does it feel to know that the redesign that you made for Donkey Kong is still used at Nintendo over two decades later? I love it. I, I think it's I'm really honoured and quite flattered because I think when Shigeru Miyamoto um, had given us permission to do our Nintendo, had given us permission to use Shigeru Miyamoto's model uh, or his design. And, and you're going to give this, um, I think I must've been how, what I can't remember what year it was, but I was either early twenties or uh, just, you know, late teens, early twenties to give it to this kid that's just discovered 3d modeling uh, who hadn't got a lot of experience with art at the time. You know, it was my first job as an artist. Um, I'd been at rare a few years, but I was experienced enough with Nintendo and so, but I wasn't a, like a fine artist. I thought, God, is this guy going to like what I've, I've produced here? And obviously if they haven't changed it, they've refined it a little bit. So they must be happy with it. And I think people are familiar with the face now. And as I say, it's, it's a battle toad with a, uh, a monkey's body, basically. Yeah, and how do you feel about Diddy Kong kind of branching out and doing really well on his own? Yeah, I mean, again, and I say I'm really, really pleased that he's still there. And and I've got Diddy Kong and I've got Donkey Kong, which I I can't claim um, ownership of any of these characters. They're not my characters; they're Nintendo characters. But it's uh, it does make me smile. Uh, I'm I'm really pleased that the, some of the characters that I was involved with the design or or redesign of. Um, are, are in Smash and have still got their own games out there and they're still popular characters today. But yeah, Diddy Kong, he, he was also designed alongside um, Donkey Kong as a partner for Donkey Kong Country. But when he got the chance to get his own game, Diddy Kong Racing, I, I was over the moon. You know, they look better than I do after 30 years. So, <laughs> But no, it's, it's great to see them all still sort of alive and kicking. So... so- as lead designer, you were responsible for so many things in the final game, such as dialogue, uh, what cons could do for attacks, animal buddies, stage layouts, and more. So naturally, if there was any mechanics that didn't make its way into the game, you'd be the best person to ask. And I'd love to start off by asking, how much did Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong change on a mechanical level over the course of the game's development? 
I guess quite quite a lot in some respects, and and not very much in others. Um, probably the, the the kind of area where they changed the most was trying to define the initial set of abilities. Um, obviously, some some of them were obvious, like run and jump, uh, but the um, the attack moves uh, caused us some real 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 fun and games with trying to find the right approach because we wanted to give them um, an iconic attack move, but um, something, something else I also wanted. I wanted the game to be fast and fluid, so if you knew what you were doing, you could kind of uh, traverse through the levels really quickly. So, so whatever attack move the characters had, it kind of had to support that thinking. Um, so we obviously had kind of bouncing on characters' heads, which was kind of seen in other games, but we wanted something else. So obviously we eventually ended up with the um the roll for donkey kong and the cartwheel for diddy kong but prior to that i think we must have must have tried probably half a dozen or even even more different types of moving attacks um i think i can remember um there was one that was like a sliding attack where the characters kind of slid into the enemies as if they were on ice um there was one where they leapfrogged enemies where they kind of Donkey bring his fist down on top of the characters' heads and then use that to propel themselves over. Oh, uh, do you mind if I ask why that wasn't used? We just couldn't make it fluid enough. Um, it, it like kind of t- to do it right, you almost had to kind of stop. Plant, you had to plant his fist and then hop over it, um, and it made it very difficult to do it in sequence. We wanted an attack that could kind of, if, if you had a row of enemies, you could kind of do it on all of them. So. With the slide, we experimented with making it really slippy so you could slide through them all. But with um, with something like a, a leapfrog, it's like a very individual thing. Um, so we tried all sorts of things, and uh, it, it kind of became a, almost a standing joke on the team, I remember. And um, every time we put a new attack in, it was always the same engineer that put it in. Um, and it got to the point where he had a piece of music um, on a CD player it was um it was queen actually another one bites the dust um so the animator come in with uh, my brother that was steve he came in with his with the disc because that's that's how everything was done in those days all the data was on disc he come in with this new attack we'd been working on that it animated um it, the engineer would load up the disc we'd put it in play it and then almost straight away we we kind of all all decide it wasn't very good so he'd play this piece of music um and steve would go off kind of dragging his heels back to his desk to have another go and, and that that process went on for for quite some time as i remember until we hit upon the um the roll attack which obviously fulfilled everything we wanted to do in terms of it was fast you could carry on doing it you could kind of skittle multiple enemies i guess it was almost like rolling um a bowling ball down a temping bowling alley you could kind of you, you had the impression of like skittling enemies out of the way and, and kind of as soon as we put that in we knew that we knew that was the one hmm. that's interesting because like so many of your design documents make it look like everything just went without a hitch oh god that, that, that's never the case <laughs> does that mean uh did you ever try to implement the owl and uh what was the other one there was two animal buddies that didn't make the cut that's right. I think I tweeted a picture of him once upon a time on, on some post-it notes, but that's such a long time ago, I can't remember. Hmm. Um, I'm trying to think. We had, we had at the very start, the the animal the animal helpers. Of course, as soon as you've got a new idea, the natural thing to do is to just go wild with it. Um, and, and, and kind of in the, before we had a reality check to kind of work out just how much we could do, there was, there was all sorts of things proposed um yeah the hour was one of them i'm trying to think what else we had um i can't remember yeah well i know that the owl was repurposed into cranky kong he kind of offered advice whereas the owl was in the dock as saying that that was his original purpose um yeah i can't remember the other one though i think you're more you seem to, you're more informed than i am it's uh <laughs> I mean, it's like 25 years ago some of the some of the stuff seems like yesterday and then some of it like you just completely forget what you actually did or what we considered at the time so until you mentioned it i can't i, I couldn't um i've forgotten that we proposed all those animals well um for the animals that did make the cut uh did you have like a favorite on a mechanical level and maybe you had a least favorite um i guess i was i always liked rambi the rhino 
I think it was it was it was our take on a horse. The animals were supposed to be um, companions, um, and they were kind of an extension of the original thinking behind having two characters um, on screen: Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong. Because um, obviously Diddy Diddy Kong effectively is a second hit. So when or vice versa, when one character gets hit, the other one takes over. Whereas games didn't normally have two characters because it's expensive to have two characters on a Super NES, but normally it's it's done in some way like Mario would shrink or characters have would have hearts or energy. But we didn't want to do that. We wanted we wanted to like um, instill a sense of companionship between the two main characters, and that kind of included them having them both on screen at once, them rescuing each other from the barrels and things like that. Mm. And the animals were just an extension of that. It was kind of there was Donkey and Diddy as companions and then they could get their animal buddies to help them out so and i think i think i like rambi the most because it was our take on a horse and a horse is is very kind of synonymous way of transport for humans um and rambi was just kind of um it was a more jungly more jungly take on that and obviously he smashes everything out of his path uh, which well, which makes it fun was it because of your preference that maybe that's why he showed up so much in the marketing I think so. I think it was. Um, I think it was just such an iconic animal um, in terms of something that. I mean, rhinos are pretty. Rhinos are pretty cool animals, even though they are very dangerous in real life. But um, they're kind of. They're like built like tanks. They smash stuff. It was. It was easy to imagine, um, certainly on the marketing materials, what you do when riding a rhino. You'd be smashing things and having a great time, like riding some of the other creatures, for instance. Um, I think it'd be less obvious um, what you were going to do, even even though each of them had their their own uh, charms. I think the rhino was just obvious. Um, in terms of the one I didn't like the most, um, unfortunately, it was poor old Winky the frog. Um, and that's that's not because I don't like frogs. Um, it was because of his the the hits on him, the hit box um, was so was so bad. It made jumping really difficult. Um, and the reason the hitbox was so bad is kind of each each character, the, the way the hits were done on the characters, they had these like little boxes drawn around them. And the more boxes you used, the more expensive it was in terms of performance. So we tried to keep the number of hitboxes for the enemies, uh, Donkey Kong, Diddy Kong and everything to an absolute minimum. But when, when Winky jumps, he gets really big, he like stretches his arms and legs out and we just couldn't afford to put hits on the entire frog, so we just concentrated some hits, like a big hit box around his body. But when you're jumping along and trying to land on platforms, you start thinking, "Oh, I can land here because that looks like part of the frog." But then there's no hits on that bit, so you fall through the platform and die. And then, like, just it makes it so much more difficult. Um, and it was, it became again a, a bit of an in joke that the frog was so hated because it was so difficult to play. But um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things you look back at and laugh at now. But at the time, we were we weren't very pleased. Sometimes it's it seems that it's only you and Tim Stamper that had uh, connections with Nintendo of Japan during the project. So I hope you're comfortable with me asking you what what were discussions like with Miyamoto and Nintendo of Japan? Um, would you be able to talk us through a memorable meeting that you once had? I think we're a few weeks in. To the game and i think we got like a demo a very early demo of donkey kong running along a few screens of the jungle i certainly don't think it was a finished level but we basically got something we got the game to a point where we we got the look of the game as we wanted it to which that took a long time but then when we got that to a point where we could actually start building something representative um nintendo asked us to come over to uh, NCL in Japan. Um, basically, they wanted to see what basically wanted to see what we we'd done. So they they kind of flew us over there, um, and we went went to see Nintendo at NCL. I mean, I was I think I was twenty two at the time, so it was quite eye opening um, for somebody that had grown up in the I'd grown up in the local area. Um, so so to be flown to Japan. Uh, to go and see Nintendo um, was was quite a was quite a privilege and an eye opener. 
Um, and I should have been nervous, but I guess being 22, I wasn't. Um, so we went to Nintendo, um, which was, which took me by surprise in the building that Nintendo were based in at the time. Like you go in there and you, you just, in your, in your head, you expect there's going to be like life-size images, life-size kind of um figurines of mario there's going to be like kind of posters all over the wall of all these great games i've done over the years and there was nothing there was absolutely nothing it was just white uh with a nintendo logo it was it was it was like really really surprising um but then so we we kind of went in the went in one of the meeting rooms and then nintendo's folks all piled in there was um there was miyamoto uh, there was Gunpai Yokoi, the creator of the Game Boy and the Virtual Boy. Um, Takeda-san uh, headed up the, probably someone that most of the industry has never heard of, uh, but he headed up, he headed up R&D1 that were doing, that did uh, Metroid. Um, so basically a bunch of, a bunch of kind of quite senior Japanese people and we, and we showed them, showed them Donkey Kong and obviously they didn't they didn't know they didn't really know what to expect even though one of the original remits we were given was um they'd seen a they'd seen a demo of the hardware we were using to create the graphics that eventually we used for donkey kong it wasn't it wasn't donkey kong at the time it was um i think it was a fighting game some kind of boxing a demo we did with these like kind of rendered fighters so they knew they kind of knew what the technology we were using, and that's why they wanted us to make the game in the first place. They, I, I remember them saying, "Make us a game that looks better than Aladdin," because at the time, Sega's Aladdin was was kind of the benchmark for graphics, and I think the Super Nintendo was being compared unfavorably with Aladdin on the um, the Genesis or the Mega Drive. So that's that's why they wanted us to use it. So they. They knew the graphics they were going to get, but I don't think they were fully prepared with what we showed them. Um, and they were all, um, they were very complimentary. They, they always are. The, um, the, the, the Nintendo people would, would never, they, they were never, like West, Western people can be quite direct, whereas, whereas the, the Japanese were always very, very respectful, very considerate. If they wanted, if they wanted to make a point, they'd, they'd do it in a very kind of polite but really focused way. Um, but but um, there was, that, that did slip once in the meeting uh, in quite an amusing way. It wasn't, it wasn't bad um, in that, I think it was, um, I think it was Mr. Yokoi that said um, that he wasn't sure that, people will be able to play the game and I mean, it kind of took us by surprise it's like why 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 can't people play the game it's like we, we were like baffled and, and then he added oh it's because it's too 3d like, as in it's too it's too much people won't be able to like cope with it being that 3d and that was it was, it was just it was just one of those moments where i could understand why you said that but at the same time i just I just wanted to laugh um, because it was it was just one of those really funny things. Because even though it's a 3D game, effectively, Donkey Kong moves in 2D, even though it looks 3D. Um, so that that was that was the thing I can remember most, and that it was too 3D. And of course, that's the story we came back with for the rest of the team that we we'd been told by Nintendo that our game was too 3D and. Uh, of course, we were never we were never going to change it because we believed in what we were what we were doing. But I think it was just I think it was just shock, initial shock of they didn't expect it to look like it did. Um, but generally, every every dealing we had with Nintendo, um, I mean, you, you're talking about people that were far more experienced making games than we were. Um, so so when they talk to you, and especially people like Miyamoto, you listen uh, because what he said was usually bang on the money and it, it explained it in a very polite, very reasoned way. Um, almost to the point where once he'd finished talking, you almost, you almost felt that, Oh, of course it should be like that. Or why didn't we think of that? Or he, it almost give you the seed of some, some thought process and then leave it with you to kind of 
think about it some more. Um, so I can see why it's such a highly rated uh, designer. Were there any gameplay ideas that were scrapped due to technical limitations on the SNES? Oh, interesting. Um, I don't. I don't remember any. Well, I guess we we probably always wanted to put in more than we could, and that's probably why you know we probably rolled some of those ideas into the second one. Um, I can't remember specifically <clears throat> what those were, but we would we, there would have been some things that wouldn't have made the cut for the first one that we would have moved over into the second one. Um, I think <clears throat> there wasn't there was probably lots of things we were trying to do in terms of uh, pushing the hardware, but it was you know it was it was probably we probably put in a lot of what we wanted and probably things that you know even at the start we didn't think we'd be able to do i mean even even the very start when we started off the project and we had some prototypes and there was this idea of we were going to be able to take these pre-rendered images and shrink them down to just 15 colors and transparent or or, you know or or a, a tiny number of colors uh how are we going to do that? Because the you know you render something on a SG workstation and it's got millions of colors, and is that even going to be possible? Because there's so the memory on the machines were so restricted, um, there was only a certain number of uh, graphics RAM that you could have, and are we actually going to be able to fit everything in there? And I'm, I remember myself and others saying, "Oh, well, it's not possible." But kind of the way we took these things, that their approach we always took was. Oh, we'll give it a go anyway. <laughs> so even though we might think yeah, it's never going to work, we'll still attempt things. And I think that's kind of how we were kind of able to be successful and do many of the things we did do is because rather than going, oh, that's not possible. And we don't we kind of close off that route. We'll give it a go anyway and see what happens. Well, it took a huge amount of effort to get to, to kind of to get what was effectively a rendered output from the silicon graphics machines into a format that works in the Super NES. And it's kind of hard to explain, but one one screen uh, that came off the Super Silicon Graphics machine in terms of memory was more than the entire cartridge uh, for the Super NES. So obviously we had to find a way of making it um, more economical. So it's, it's almost like, imagine, imagine a screen that came off the Silicon Graphics machine as a a million piece jigsaw uh, we had to then try and convert that into maybe like a thousand piece jigsaw uh, which which represented the super NES. so that that kind of mean you had to kind of replicate bits of the jigsaw so you could use them over and over again and save memories so we put the things together and then uh, we, we we ran through a few different software uh, routines to get um the colors down into an algorithm which which brought it down into a color palette of 15 colors which sounds unbelievable really when you because we were used to using this high end software which you, you didn't really count the colors it was using millions of colors because it was photorealistic and of course you got such a tiny palette on the um the super nes uh, much better than the nes but it was you know it was still basically uh, a very small palette but it didn't matter because as soon as the character started moving around and you'd got animation on it, well, even when it was still really with the lighting, it's, uh, it, it became very clear that it was a solid um, 3D model that had been rendered. And when it started moving around and we managed to get it on a Super Nintendo in, in just a, a pretty small amount of sprites, it was just, wow, is this really running on a Super NES? All right, so there's a common misconception among more casual video game fans, I'd suppose, um, that composers simply compose the music and the rest is handled by the rest of the team. But that would be robbing you of the credit that you're owed uh, for getting the music to run so well on the Super Nintendo hardware. Without holding back any technical terms, could you talk about the process and challenges you face getting Donkey Kong Country's music to sound as good as it did uh, in the final product? Well, there, there, there were several technological limitations or challenges to, to circumnavigate. First of all, uh, I couldn't play my keyboard and it would come out and you'd be able to listen to it. And um, the, the way we got around that was I, I would type in numbers because the, 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 normally on a keyboard you have this thing called MIDI, which is like a, a musical interface, digital exchange type thing. So when you press a note on the keyboard, you can hear it on your computer. We can hear it on another sound source, but we didn't have that luxury. So I, I, I rough out a rough idea on my keyboard, write it down into hex numbers. There'd be a hex number for the actual uh, tone of the, the note, and then there'd be another hex number 
for the length of the note and then there'd be subroutines if you wanted pitch shifts and that kind of stuff so it was all very involved and there were eight channels as i said there were eight monophonic channels so if you and everything had to be in sync it had to all add up so if there was i don't know two minutes of music on one of these channels there had to be exactly two minutes on on the other seven channels otherwise it all went horribly wrong and it took a long time you, you, you do a, a few bars or maybe even some of a bar just to hear what it sounded like and then you'd have to get everything else in sync and, and do it seven more times so it was it was quite an involved process it's certainly not easy it, it took a lot of dedication it took a lot of focus and i'm glad we don't have those limitations anymore because it's enough to send anybody mad so Donkey Kong Country had this incredible accomplishment, basically pioneering and showing the world what 3D pre-rendered graphics could look like if done right in a video game. However, since that's the case, uh, your team had to effectively design the template for any future developers to reference in the future. So what was it like having to adapt this cutting edge technology, as well as the advantages it must have given you and the team? Uh, well, I mean, I won't deny that initially it was, it was very hard. Um, well, it was for me at least. It was it was a really steep learning curve. Um, so there was only initially there was three of us using these SGI machines. So the knowledge uh, the knowledge base of what the software could do wasn't that huge across the company. Though that's just three of us, and I mean we had manuals, ridiculously thick manuals. But um, there was no YouTube to look at for advice there was just a great big manual or actually as it was a volume it was like a encyclopedia britannica volume it was just several several really thick books and you just sat there with the book every night without any tuition just trying to well, how do i how do i put bones in this and how do i make this move and i think i use mine for propping up open the door that's about how much use it was for because it's quite quite technical as well you know it wasn't written from um an artist's point of view um so i guess i guess you're on your own to a certain extent so because of course there was nothing in the way of um you know you couldn't consult the internet type in or you know how do you do this and that you were you know very much on your own we also had the motion capture, which was great fun because it was a new um, new thing to experiment with. A lot of the things at the time, we were we were really experimenting um, with, with brand new software, often beta testing stuff. And now I, I was kind of wrestling with, with, this th with this world of 3D, which was like, it was, you know, it was just incredible, but really scary at the same time because the potential was there to create anything. But every five minutes you know my computer seemed to crash because I'd, I'd done something wrong which is you know something i i never had before and say like something as simple as i like, i know what i want to do like i want to say oh, i want to put a hole in this object and i'd spend all day trying to do it and it wasn't working and then i'd just ask um tim stamper and he'd say oh you just do this this and this and he'd do it in like a few minutes because he was more experienced and generally better than me so and then I, you know it was just it went on like that for a few months a bit before it sort of started to click I think but it was <laughs> it was it was difficult. You designed all the artwork for the entire Kremlin army as far as I am aware of uh, including of course uh, the big boss himself King K. Rule. So you're the best person to ask this particular question which is that um, you would know the history of King K. Rool's design that the general public doesn't even get to know about. So various questions for you. Uh, for example, was he always plump? Was his stomach always gold? And uh, is it true that the gold belly is supposed to be armor? Uh, what can you tell us about the design before the final design? Um, well, K. Rool actually goes back to a time when I, I didn't work on him. So he was... Um, he was concepted by um, a great um, artist artist at the time at Rare called um, James Ryman. Um, he was made for um, another game. In fact, all the Kremlings were made for another game. It was going to be um, like a point and click adventure game on PC and Mac, I think, called and that was called Johnny Blastoff and the Kremlin Armada. It was a point and click adventure game set in space. Um, so this was at a time where, I mean, Lucas, Lucas Arts were on top of their game with point and click um, adventure games, and we we were all massive fans of them. 
So we thought, oh, what what would Rare's version of that be? And that wasn't on Nintendo. This this was aimed to be on, I think it was Macintosh was the primary platform at the time. I mean, PC was not not considered a gaming machine, but um, the old Macintoshes used to be. So we spent a little while kind of thinking of what what our point and click adventure was going to be. And we had this kind of superhero in space and the bad guys were the Kremlins, but they're all very, they're all very space military with like armor and laser pistols and stuff like that. Um, and eventually the concept didn't go anywhere. So we shelved it. Um, it's a great name though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the, but the, um, the, the Kremlins James had done were very different to the ones I ended up doing because I, I just adapted them. Um, to the to the world of of Rares Donkey Kong. So, um, but in terms of you know, were there any early versions of him? Not not really. I mean, he was he was always plump. He, his stomach his stomach was always gold, and, and yes, it is armor. Um, I mean, the, 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 the schedule was so tight. I don't think there was room for a lot of experimentation. Uh, you know, experimentation. I don't think anyone was going to come in and say. Oh, you know, I don't like that K. Rool character. Can you do a different version, Steve? You know, because because there just wasn't the time. It was a small team, and we we worked a lot of overtime on the project. I mean, we basically put our lives on hold. But then, when it came to Donkey Kong, and we were looking for some bad guys, um, obviously Donkey Kong as a character at the time had got very little history beyond beyond him and Donkey Kong Jr. and Mario as Jumpman with a hammer and Pauline, but the IP didn't really have anything else. So we had to invent uh, a bunch of bad guys for Donkey Kong to fight. So I don't, I don't know what, I don't know how we hit upon the idea of using the Kremlins, but but we did. We thought, oh yeah, the crocodiles, they, they'd be quite cool. But obviously they, they were still in this kind of more serious form with um, with guns and laser guns and armor and stuff like that. So, so the first thing we did was I thought, oh, we need to get rid of the um, spacey modern stuff. So we dropped the um, we dropped all the all the kind of lasers and replaced it with more kind of um, today's military stuff like. And that's where the kind of guns and I think the idea of having mortars and things like that came from. So that was that was step one. But then, but then we thought it, it just even with that change, it didn't really fit the the tone of the rest of the game we wanted. We wanted it to be quite lighthearted um, and fun, and all the bad guys having guns and stuff like that. It just, it just didn't seem right, um, so we ditched them. So that was completely on your own accord. It was there was no intervention as far as that goes. No, not whatsoever. I mean, there was there was very little intervention. We were we were left pretty much to our own devices to make Donkey Kong um, on the whole, which was great. Um, then, I mean, when Nintendo did have input, it was always really good input, um, which which made the game better. It was never, we, it was never like, oh, we don't like that character, or we don't like this. It was, it was always really supportive, or have you thought about doing this? Or, um, so no, I mean, we were, we were left to our, pretty much to our own devices. Hmm. Um, and we just we just felt tonally the game was developing as we were going along, and the Kremlins. I mean, I've I've, I've done it many times since in the games I've done since. I always I always like the bad guys being someone you feel slightly sorry for. Like King K. Rule is pretty useless, <laughs> even though even though he's in charge of the Kremlins. I, I've I've never liked the idea of having the having the ultimate bad guy, someone that's all powerful and evil. Um, I just like them being charmingly bad and slightly incompetent at the same time. So all the ones I've done, like Gruntilda and uh, the Baron in Ghoulies and Professor Pester in Viva Piñata, they've all got this same trait running through them, which is on the surface they might seem bad, but underneath they're, they're, they're just a bit rubbish. <laughs> And, and the and the kind of minions reflect that, so I didn't want the Kremlins to be too too scary or too competent. So, oh well, if that was your goal, there was one enemy that scared me as a kid. It was uh, the Rock Croc, the enemy that's in the caves. Oh, was it? Oh, yeah, because you couldn't see the stuff. 
Claptrap himself was quite scary. The guy with the, the little crocodile with the snappy teeth. Oh, yeah. Um, that was actually... The, the noise of them teeth was actually one of the artists uh, snapping his own teeth. And it, it was the kind of sound that when, when he did it next to you, it just it just made your skin crawl. It just didn't sound human that somebody could snap their teeth that loudly. It was it was like horrible. It felt like, oh, he must have broke all his teeth doing that, but he could do it naturally. So we got him up to the, well, I say recording studio. We didn't really have a recording studio in those days, but got him over to the audio guys to record him clacking away with his teeth could you share who did various things like diddy kong donkey kong the kremlings um as well as sound samples from i know one of the songs that you didn't particularly work on but uh the funky kong theme with the woo and the ah yeah uh yeah that was robin so i, I take in his um he, it was originally going to go onto killer instinct on onto the arcade board and i don't think it was going to be used so we um i took it adapted it put it onto the snes and so he found that sample of the oh yeah, yeah. Uh, also as, as for um vocal sound effects there was well, we have this gardener called des and he he done some of the vocal effects mark betridge who was a programmer um and also went on to, to be one of the directors he did a lot of the monkey sounds and things like the kremlins i believe it was chris sutherland so he as, as usual he steps forward and lends his voice to the the sound effects for and companies such as Rare. It's it's starting to sound like it's not true, but maybe you can uh, put the nail, last nail in the coffin on this one. Did uh, the Ministry of Defense contact Rare with concerns about the technology your team was housing? <laughs> uh, not not to my not to my knowledge. No, I know I know we used to get some very kind of eyebrows raised with the amount of power that the studio used. Um, because at the time we were still based in the village of Twycross, whereas now we've got our own dedicated headquarters. But at the time we were based in Twycross, which is like a really small rural village with like uh, it's got a, a sm- it's got a small school and did have a small post office, but maybe maybe a couple of hundred houses at the most. Um, and then there was there was rare that sat on the edge of the village in this old farmhouse with these converted outbuildings. Um, Donkey Kong was made in one of the barns, um, but we had to have special electric cable put in just to feed the studio because the um, the power supply that fed the village wasn't enough to run to run all the um, all the silicon graphic hardware we were using to render Donkey Kong. So I, I remember the electricity board being really really curious about what the hell we were up to because because of the amount of power we used and. In the early days, quite often we we get like power outages, um, and just the entire studio had come to a grind into a halt. But uh, that wasn't that wasn't good because we had a deadline. We had to get this game finished. So every time we lost power, which was quite often, um, we we got a bunch of petrol generators out um, and ba- and and connected them all up with extension leads, and it was I mean. I'm sure it wasn't safe, but we used to have like this snake, snake of extension leads absolutely everywhere, like leads plugged into leads, um, just to get everybody working again. Um, it just got to the point where we didn't bother putting the leads away. They were just, they were just lying around everywhere, waiting for the next power outage, and then we'd switch it, get the generators fired up, and carry on working. It sounds like a nightmare. But, but, but no, no, no Ministry of Defence. I mean, at the at the time, it was a nightmare, and it's it's one of those things you look back on fondly now but at the time it was like oh god not again and then you'd be working away and these generators would be howling away outside the window now a lot of players these days understand how difficult it is to make a 2d platforming game thanks to uh, mario maker i can say that i'm pretty bad at it but that (laughs) all the more uh, adds respect to uh, your creed and i wanted to ask you uh what exactly was your design philosophy going into donkey kong country if you had one as I kind of mentioned before, I wanted the levels to be fast and fluid. I, I kind of, when I was talking about it, I used the phrase "go first time." Uh, so if you knew if you knew exactly what you were doing, you could you could go first time, and, and all the levels were structured so you could do that. They the anim, the enemies lined themselves up, and they were very they were very carefully spaced. So say you had a series of steps with an enemy on each one, you could kind of hop on top of their 
heads of each uh, enemy and make your way up the steps. And they'd, they'd all be set up to be moving in the right direction so you could do that. Um, and it was the same thing with like the levels with the rope swinging. The ropes were set up so that as you came on screen, they were kind of swinging towards you. So if you were brave enough to go first time, you didn't have to stop and wait. Um, and probably the, the best example of the whole lot is the barrels, uh, which you get in and shoot yourself around. Um, they were all very, very carefully set up. So they almost flowed. So when you watch a really good player, it's, it's, it's really, really fast. Um, and, and nowadays, um, or it's been happening for quite a few years, people have been speed running the Donkey Kong games um, quite a lot. And they weren't designed for that in terms of, I mean, speed running wasn't a thing at all, but the levels were certainly designed so that if you're familiar with them, you could almost look really good by going really fast. And it gave you that sense of satisfaction, even though the level design was helping you by by kind of how it was set up. Um, but in terms of how they were made, um, they they were made, they were all made on post-it notes, um, which are stuck together on like big pieces of A2 paper. Um, so at the start of, um, at the start of a level, we, we kind of come up with a theme of what it was going to be like tires or ropes or underwater or, or whatever. Uh, and then, and then we kind of come up with as many different ways of using that feature. So that's why when you see the levels, there, there tends to be one or two features that feature predominantly, whether it's, oh, this level's got the tires, this level's got the burning oil drums, this has got this. And then we'd like come up with as many variations as we could on how we could possibly use that feature from really easy versions to really hard ones. And they're all, they're all on post-it notes, all these variations. Um, and then we'd get the we get all the variations and then kind of arrange them in a rough order on a piece of, on a big piece of paper with gaps in between. So we kind of work out, oh, we want the easiest version of it at the start. This is the really hard version that we put right at the end to test players before the exit. And here's all the kind of other variations in between. And then we'd almost fill in the gaps by, oh, between this bit and that bit, we'll have some steps or between this bit and that bit, we'll have a slope that goes down. So it was, it was, it was kind of done by getting the framework in place first um, and then filling the gaps in later. Hmm. And post-it notes made that really good because if you didn't like what you'd done, you just screw the post-it note up, throw it away and draw another one. <laughs> was that um, uh, an idea that you kind of came up with, with the post-it notes, or is that something you kind of picked up through the trade? I. It was a bit of both. We'd heard a rumor, but we hadn't seen it, that um, Miyamoto-san used post-it notes in his design. Um, so we thought, oh, well, if it's good enough for uh, the world's best designer, um, then maybe we should be doing it too. So we, so we just bought some post-it notes, and then, and then almost without not knowing what to do with it. And then it wasn't, it wasn't long that we then kind of hit upon they're actually, they're actually almost – the size of them almost mimic the size of a screen. So I thought, oh, well, if we drew stuff on them, they could mimic the screens we're going to build. So, so we weren't quite sure what to use them for, but we ended up, whether whether by luck or judgment or a bit of both, ended up um, using them to design the games. And they kind of, they kind of after after Donkey Kong using Post-it notes um, kind of fell out of favour with me. I started. I mean, the games I did afterwards, I never used post-it notes again for a long time. Then bizarrely, Sea of Thieves has almost seen a renaissance in that almost the entire planning of the game was all completely done on post-it notes. We never had, we had very, very few design documents because I, I just don't like them because it takes ages to write them and then they become out of date really quickly as soon as you start trying to implement things. So I'm always a big fan of trying to keep design fluid. Um, and post-it notes, again, certainly do that. But rather than drawing bits of levels that we did for Donkey Kong, for Sea of Thieves, effectively, all the features in the game were just a post-it note. So we had a big board of, this is what the features are going to be, and these are the ones we're going to pick for this reason. Um, but it was, just, it, was just, it was just, it was almost like coming full circle, like 25 years later, we've been using post-it notes. Um, 
And even the ones I've still got from 25 years ago, they're still sticky. <laughs> so you've been quoted as saying, the time you spent working on Donkey Kong Country helped carve your style as a video game uh, composer. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Um, I, I think it's just Donkey Kong Country. It's mainly, I, I came from the, the NES background, the Nintendo Entertainment System, which has an incredibly limited sound source. It's got four notes. It's got, um, I think it's two, uh, two pulse width modulation channels and a, a triangle wave and also a noise channel as well but you've got four monophonic channels which means you can only hear one note at a time so you have the the noise channel which is very and that's that's it and the other sound I, I don't know very very harsh and I think at the time in in the 80s when I was writing the NES music it, it sounded like a glorified doorbell I don't think there's a better way of putting it than that so it was quite a challenge to make it sound very good but you'd hear the stuff that people at Nintendo were doing and it would all sound very polished and, and they'd clearly got a better handle on it than, than I had at the time uh, and so I'd scratch my head and go back and, and try and improve what I was doing but the, the good thing about that is it makes you realize how important those four channels were the, the percussion channel the bass channel and the two notes that you have for your melody and you have to suggest a lot of the chordal work by using the clever use of melody and clever use of two notes to, to suggest a chord and I think that shapes the way that going on from there that you, that you write music obviously it was developed for the Super NES and then after that it was that that method of finding out what the important bits of a tune are and making sure they're heard and the other bits are suggested probably influenced the style that I still use to this day you're the man who would be the best to answer this and put it to rest for good um, a lot of Cranky Kong's dialogue in Donkey Kong Country um, it points to an affinity for the old Donkey Kong arcade. Even the game's intro features Cranky Kong playing the classic tune uh, before being interrupted. And uh, I guess, yeah, with all that in mind, can you confirm or deny whether or not Cranky Kong was intended to be uh, the old arcade Donkey Kong? Yes, that was the original intention. Um, I don't think we really pushed it much because we were we were very aware of the situation we had with donkey kong jr and us being seen to almost take liberties with nintendo's characters that we thought if we if we push it too much and, and kind of make and, and kind of make it a big part of the game that he is the original donkey kong we we kind of i guess we risk the character either being changed or taken out so so we, even even in in our heads, yes, he was, but the game doesn't really doesn't really kind of promote him that much. Even though even though I think there's enough in there in the game that suggests he is, or you get the feeling that he is related to Donkey Kong in some way. Um, we did, to be honest, we didn't really think about it that much. I mean, years later, I mean, I still get questions about people asking about the Donkey Kong family. Uh, that we created because if you look at it it's a bizarre family because you've got donkey kong that's a gorilla you've got diddy that's a monkey and those two are supposed to be related in some way it just doesn't it <laughs> biologically it doesn't work but at the time we just we just didn't think about that it was we wanted a big character that was big and strong we wanted a small character that was seemed to be like more nimble so one was a gorilla one was a monkey that's as far as we ever thought about it so the old guy the old guy being the old the um the older relative was just something we put in because we wanted a character that was almost harking harking back to the old times so we could we could write all this hopefully funny dialogue that we got in our heads in the summer of 1994 ces which was basically the e3 at the time unveiled donkey kong country to the world uh, I'm told that you were there for the event, and I was wondering if you could take us through that whole experience and uh, what you must have felt and what people's first time reactions were. I wasn't actually at the the there's a the presentation part, but I was in at the show, um, you kind of on the show floor. But at the presentation part, I know that they they kind of showed some images and sequences and kind of made people think that this was the basically the project reality was going to be it which was a nintendo 64 that made people believe oh that this is obviously this these rendered visuals are actually for this new machine this, that was rumored to come up and then of course the big reveal was actually no this is on the super nintendo uh, and 
that was kind of a, a big shock for people in the audience as they were kind of thinking, wait, what? That can't be right. Uh, because this was, you know, significantly visually better than anything else. And in fact, that actually causes problems in a way in when you then move to the, something like uh, the Nintendo 64, which is polygonal based. And then you're faced with trying to match the visual quality of what you just produced uh, on a 2D machine. And uh, so that's in a, in a kind of funny way. It makes you dive more difficult to make the Nintendo 64 game stand out. I was lucky enough um, to go. A, a few of us were. And, you know, I, I can remember it like it was it was yesterday, really. Cause it was it was just it was such an exciting time. We were so, you know, we were just so excited to see what. Well, we knew we knew people would be amazed by what we created. I mean, how could they not be? comparing what what we done compared to other games of the day it was it was just such a massive massive graphical leap forward um but what what i really remember is the day before the show it was um it was unveiled at the nintendo press conference and people were just they were just blown away they they genuinely thought the game was for nintendo's next gen hardware that hardware that would become the n64 and it just looked that incredible so when it was announced the game would be releasing later in the year on this on the super nintendo everyone was they were just stunned i mean sitting in that audience with with the cheers and applause for what we had made it, it, it'll always be my proudest moment in my game making career i think so you know i, I was i was only 20 and i, I peaked already i guess <laughs> yeah really <laughs> oh i wouldn't it, say that it, it was all it was all downhill from this point no way. Banjo Kazooie, come on. Um, <laughs> all right, but I guess from there we can move on. It actually kind of uh, ties into the next question. Um, 25 years later, Donkey Kong Country still holds up as an unforgettable classic in a lot of people's eyes. Uh, for the first day that you were on the project, did you predict or anticipate being involved with something so timeless? Um, I mean, for me, it's difficult to say where the kind of project started because I've been kind of trying to learn... 3d kind of almost external to what the game would have been so i was just like i'll probably be like rendering wine glasses on checkerboards you know the sort of thing everyone did when they first learned um, 3d and then eventually some some concept art was done for um donkey kong and, and eventually i was kind of um tasked with making some characters we had donkey kong just walking along on a normal uh, hand-drawn back background at the start, and, and and even that looked amazing. And when then when that was eventually coupled with these amazing backgrounds that Tim made, it was you know it it, it just had the feel of a very special project right from the start. It was just one of those things we all believed in what we were doing. We we had no idea it was going to be as successful as it was. We were all we were all very young. It was just an opportunity to work with Nintendo on Donkey Kong. It was we we all put in like. The kind of crazy hours that we probably couldn't do these days because <laughs> you'd probably kill yourself doing it. But when, you, when you're in your early 20s, um, and to me at the time, building games was still a hobby. So when you're that passionate about a hobby, you we we'd, we'd literally would have to be thrown out the offices um, at night to, and be told to go home because we were there all hours trying to bring this game to life. And I guess as a, as a, as a team... We did feel more like a family. We certainly saw more of our workmates than we did our real families. And then by, I think, the November uh, or December of 1993, we had the first level up and running and we were playing that. And I think at that point we thought, hang on, this is there's something special here. But you kind of, because we're so busy, we just don't think about it that much. I think it was the only when we were going to the, I think it was CES or uh, show that we uh, or e3 or whatever it was at the time back in in later in the in the next year when we pretty much got the game done there was still a number of levels to be completed and we're on the plane and i remember reading about the things that were coming up for uh, the show and all the top things and i knew that we hadn't revealed yet and i thought wow did the, the what we've got here uh, not in that kind of big-headed way but i could see that visually it was a step above anything else so I, I knew that people were in for a big surprise and and as it turned out it, it all worked out well i think the game can still be appreciated even now as something very special uh, to 
to new people or people replaying it uh it's 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 still got a unique look and and you know dave dave wise's music will always be amazing it's just timeless and tim stamper said at at the start of the project you know he said oh you know i want to make a game that 20 years later it'll still look awesome and I, i think i think he i think we achieved that i mean you can you know i hope people can kind of appreciate the history of the game when they play it because it was it was such an important game for both rare and nintendo i mean dkc and the other pre-rendered games that came after it from rare extended the life of the um, super nintendo until the n64 was ready and it's its importance can never be under underestimated 25 years later uh, people still fondly remember donkey kong of course um did you have any words for the fans of your work uh, well thank you for listening thank you for um uh, I don't know, so all the enthusiasm 25 years later, it, it's it's very good, very humbling. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased it, it kind of worked out. Well, I, the message I'd give to everybody else uh, is thanks for playing and thanks for continuing to play and uh, just continuing to be fans of the, of the game. We've tried to be very careful about who we employ and who we put together to try and to try and bring out the best in people. So you get that kind of combined positivity. It's not not always the easiest thing to do, but uh, I think when that happens, the results speak for themselves. Thank you so much to the incredible guests that have come on today to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Donkey Kong Country. You guys are legends, and I really appreciate this. So at the end of each interview that I conducted, I asked each gentleman what projects they're currently working on, or anything that they would like to talk about that they've just put out. So if you would be so kind, it would mean a lot to me if you gave it a listen. Just released uh, Ukulele and the Impossible Lair, which is a 2D platformer, plus also it's got a 3D overworld. And uh, I think if you have a look around the internet, you'll find that people are comparing that to Donkey Kong Country uh, in terms of its influence. And I think, um, although it's not something we set out to make it to be Donkey Kong Country, I think just as a natural evolution of the people that are working on it and the games that we like from the past, there's definitely influences in there in that game. Absolutely, yes. We're doing a, a joint project where Kev's doing all of the artwork and I am writing at the moment on the, on the very project and we're bringing out a, a sort of collector's album of music that I, I've, I've, some of the music I've collected and has been used or recycled from, from, from other areas or just put together and I've never had a chance to use it. And we're just writing some original tunes. So, so hopefully early next year, we hope to have this album out. And the, the idea is just to make a, a sort of collector's thing of the stuff that we've done together um, at Rare and, and, and since then, really. So it, it's a definitely a collector's type of art, I suppose. That, that would be the best best kind of thing to describe it. So, yeah, but we're, we're excited about that. Salamandos, yeah. And, yeah, and we're, I think um, Dave, Dave Wise and I are coming over to uh, America to, is it in Washington, D.C.? In January, um, we're going to come over there and, and perhaps give some T-shirts away, sell T-shirts maybe to anyone that wants to buy one. Or um, and I think we're going to be doing some music and coming over, we're doing a bit of a tour over this next year. So uh, we'll be promoting that as our side project. But um, aside from that, um, working hard with Playtonic Games, we've just uh, released Ukulele and the Impossible Lair, which is getting amazing reviews. So people should go out and buy that if they like the whole feel of Donkey Kong Country and they love the um, sort of exploration feel of um, um, Link's Awakening, then they're going to love this game. So I think um, they should try that too. Um, And now, of course, uh, we are moving on at Playtonic and getting on with whatever comes next. So, yeah, it's all all go. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, um, so Playtonic, uh, we've just released our second game. It's called Ukulele and the Impossible Lair. And um, it's very much a DKC style game, so hopefully the people who are listening to this, because it's about DKC, will be interested in it. Um, you know, it's, it's got colourful platforming, creative level design. It's very challenging. The 2D levels they're accessed um, from a giant 3D overworld, which is it's so much more than a map screen. It's got secrets to find and puzzles to solve. 
and we've been getting some great reviews and platforming fans should definitely check it out because they, they won't be disappointed. Everwild, I just saw the trailer for that, that looks amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, like I say, early, early days yet, but uh, um, well, we'll see how it goes. I mean, it's uh, like I say, it's, it's just, it's kind of where Sea of Thieves was like five years ago where we released something and I guess with the pirate game, it's a bit more obvious that, oh, I'm sure there'll be some treasure in there at some point. Oh, I'm sure we'll be firing cannons. Obviously, with something like Everwild, we've deliberately left it a lot vaguer. And, and that's kind of all the feedback we're getting at the moment is, looks awesome, but what do you do? Um, so, 